Good morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to encourage us to, to use the prelude as an opportunity to prepare ourselves uh, as we come in to worship.
Once again, good morning and welcome. And as I am sharing some of the announcements in the bulletin, I would invite and encourage you to please make use of the Ministry of Friendship pew pad. Uh, those of you closest to the aisle will find it beside you. Please pick it up, provide the information requested, and share it with your neighbor beside whom you're worshiping this morning. Uh, several announcements. First of all, um, uh, Terry Sinclair will be with us on March the 4th. I heard from Diane and Terry yesterday uh, with the questionable weather early this morning. Uh, they did not get out, but they will be with us on the 4th. And what we're doing in the month of February is we're telling what next God stories, the, the you know, moments in our history uh, where we have responded to the call of God. We've stepped up and done really uh, big, important things for neighbors. And, uh, and one of those stories is the Sinclair Health Center. And Terry's going to tell that story on the 4th. And then next uh, Sunday, we're going to hear about the Jubilee Kitchen. Um, speaking of what next, God, uh, if you have yet to participate in one of the forums, please note the schedule, and I encourage you to do so. We'd love to hear from everyone, and so you can see the opportunities to do that. And uh, Additionally, uh, during the month of February, we uh, recognize the many, many ways in which our congregation uh, through outreach ministries uh, is uh, involved in the community either with uh, funding or with uh, people, that is volunteers that make all this stuff happen. So uh, I trust that you are seeing this in your uh, uh, worship bulletin. And if you happen, if, if you look at this list and you notice, hey, I volunteer for one of those, I'm going to invite you to stand. And uh, so I know I'm, you're going to have to look at it quickly. I'll read them. Uh, the Sinclair Health Clinic, Faith in Action, Literacy Volunteers, Northwest uh, Works, CCAP, Highland Food Pantry, Jubilee Kitchen, Winchester Rescue Mission, Laurel Center, Kids Club, Fremont Street, Winchester Day, Watts. So if you had done anything, stand. Don't be bashful. Thank you very, 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 very much. Um, it's folks like you that care for neighbors. So God bless you. And if you would like to, and you currently are not, uh, this resource has all the contact names and the uh, numbers as well as emails. So uh, any additional announcements? If not, I'm going to invite Tara forward. We are making our way to Jerusalem to become uh, spiritually and physically fit. So, Tara. Good morning. Uh, like Dan said, it's time for Walk to Jerusalem, and we've done this for several years now. And uh, what it is is a, an event we do as a church family uh, that allows us to log our miles for exercise and for devotional time to see if we can get the 5,933 miles it takes to get from Winchester to Jerusalem. So how you get these miles is by exercising, whether it's walking, swimming, running, taking a class, doing yoga, uh, playing golf, anything that gets your body moving. If you're in a, a sport, your team sport practices count. So you can be a little kid taking dance classes and you can participate in this. So it's for everyone. Um, if you're doing something that doesn't have an actual mile calculation, 15 minutes spent equals a mile. And you can turn those in uh, as, long, as well as uh, time in devotion. So whether it's in your Bible, reading a devotional for Lent, uh, part of a, a Bible study, a faith study, all of that counts, and that is timed as well. 15 minutes is equal to a mile. Um, you can turn them in to me in several different ways. I will make a post on Facebook on the church website, on the church Facebook page every weekend. Uh, you can send them to my email. My email is on the bulletin board that I put up just outside the sanctuary. Uh, or you can get a slip of paper from the bulletin board, which will be out there tomorrow. The paper, I had a printer issue, so they're not there yet. Uh, and I'll, I'll tally them each week, and we'll see if we can get there by uh, Easter. In the past, we have not only gotten there, we've gotten back. Back, and I think one or two times we almost got back to Jerusalem again. So I look forward to seeing how much we can accomplish together. Thank you. Tara, thank you very much. Also, one uh, adjustment to our worship. When we get to the um, communion hymn, we're going to sing all five verses instead of the three as indicated. So with that, uh, let us uh, continue with our worship.
Let us join our voices in the responsive call to worship. Ashes have been smeared and sins have been confessed. These times, they are troubling. This journey, it is hard. It is God who sustains, not the temptations of this world. And the Lord is our trust, our protection from harm. Come, let us worship the one whom we serve. Together, let us offer our sin to God using the prayer of confession before us. God, we come with hesitant steps and uncertain motives to sweep out the corners where sin has accumulated and uncover the ways we have strayed from your truth. Expose the empty and barren places where we don't allow you to enter. Reveal our half-hearted struggles where we have been indifferent to the suffering of others. Nurture the faint stirrings of new life where your spirit has begun to grow. Let your healing light transform us into the image of your Son. For you alone can bring new life and make us whole. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven, and be at peace with God and with your neighbor. Amen.
Be seated, please. At this time, I invite uh, young children forward for our children's moment. So today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, and so it is a good time to think about ways that we can follow Christ and be the best followers of him that we can be. Um, and so there's some, something I want to show you, a way that, that we can think about doing that. But first, I have some pictures to show you. So there are some things that absolutely every person needs to live well. And so help me, help me name those things. What is this? Food. Every person needs food. What else do they need? Water. Shelter. Shelter. Place to live. This one's tricky. What might this person need? This person who's sick. Medicine or a doctor. So, they, so do you have a place you go when you're sick? You go to the doctor and they can give you medicine sometimes to help you help you get better. That's an important thing we all need. And, and every person needs an education, a place to learn. They need an opportunity to go to school. Every child needs that. And grown-ups need that too, an opportunity to learn. Um, so we are blessed because we have all of these things. But I want you to imagine that only I have these things and you don't have any of these things and I actually also happen to have a lot of extra money so I've got all the things that I need to live well and you don't have any and I've got extra money so what do you think I should do with this money what do you think? I should help other people. Maybe I should help you. If you were a person who didn't have the things you needed to live, maybe I should share out of what I have whew, with you. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to give each of you a part of what I have to make sure that you have the things that you need. So when I share out of what I have, it helps everyone have the things that they need. So now it's not just me who has these important things. It's all of us. And so a neat thing that our church does, that our whole big church denomination, PCUSA does, um, and other denominations too, um, is share fish banks with people each each Lent um, so that these can be used to take coins that can help people in the same way that we talked about today. So people who don't have food or water or medical care or a place to live or an education, these banks, all the money that goes into them helps provide for people who don't have the things they need to live well. Um, so if you haven't gotten one of these, I'll have one to share with you today it's a way that we can share and this is called the one great hour of sharing you guys know about sharing um, that's an important important word and an opportunity for us to share with others all right so if you will join me in a word of prayer and congregation join along with us let's pray dear lord, dear lord we pray for everyone, pray for everyone who, doesn't who doesn't have enough to live well Please help, us to share Please help us to share so that others will have enough. Will have enough. We, ask we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. 
The children may return to their families or go out to Wee One's worship, and I invite us, if able, to please stand past the peace of Christ, and in deference to cold and flu season, you can do elbow bumps. That's just fine. So. Our scripture lesson is from the gospel according to St. Mark, uh, reading the first chapter, verses 9 through 15. And Mark is the very earliest of uh, the Christian gospels. It's the shortest, and Mark uh, puts a, a lot of information in a small space. For instance, in these six verses, we have three stories Mark gives us the baptism, Mark gives us the temptation, Mark gives us the beginning of Jesus' public ministry in Galilee. So uh, let us listen for what the Spirit has to say to the church this day. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice from heaven, you are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I indicated, there are three things going on in this very, very brief passage of the Bible. We have Jesus' baptism, we have Jesus' temptation, and we have the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And we've already explored Jesus' baptism. We did that back in January on Baptism of the Lord Sunday. Today, I want us to look at the temptation. And I'll save the beginning of Jesus' public ministry for another Sunday. Jesus' temptation shows up in three of our four New Testament Gospels. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke. But Mark's version is the tersest. There isn't much here. Mark provides us with very little detail, whereas Matthew's account and Luke's account of Jesus' temptation provides us with extensive detail. You know, in Matthew and Luke, uh, Jesus and his tempter, Satan, have this extensive ongoing conversation. There are three very detailed temptations. 
And each temptation addresses who will determine Jesus' life. What will determine Jesus' ministry? Will it be God or will it be Satan? Which, of course, is the fundamental spiritual question for every single one of us. Who will determine our lives? What will determine our lives? Will it be God or will it be Satan? Now, by contrast, Mark tells us only where the temptation occurred, the wilderness. He tells us who tempted Jesus, Satan. He tells us how long the temptation lasted, 40 days. He tells us who else was there in the wilderness with Jesus and Satan, the wild beasts, the angels. Mark, as a writer, has made the decision that his readers, that's you and me, don't need any additional information. The information he provides is sufficient for his gospel. It's sufficient for our salvation. It's sufficient for our spiritual formation. Mark gives us all that we need. The setting and time frame, wilderness, 40 days. The characters, Jesus, Satan, wild beasts, angels. And he gives us the action, temptation. So let's look at what I believe are the two most important elements of this story. One is the setting, the wilderness, and two is the action, the temptation. Now, wilderness is both a place and a metaphor in the Bible. The Hebrew and Greek words for wilderness occur nearly 300 times in the Bible. You know, the Hebrews, led by Moses, wandered for 40 years in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt and before they entered the land God promised them. It is one of Israel's most formative memories. There in the wilderness, they experienced a wild and inhospitable landscape. There in the wilderness... They sought a new land as they pilgrimed forward. And there in the wilderness, they encountered God. As a metaphor, wilderness is rich with spiritual meaning. You know, consider why people go into the wilderness in the Bible. There seems to be at least two primary reasons. One, it's to get away from stuff, which may include problems. You know, think Moses after he murders an Egyptian in the labor camps, and think Jesus after intense periods of activity in his public ministry. It's off to the wilderness. But there's a second reason And this is when a person is driven into the wilderness, not by choice, but in order to learn something important about himself, about herself, about God. Think the Hebrews after the Exodus. Think Jesus in today's passage. What will Jesus learn about himself in that wilderness? What will Jesus learn about God in that wilderness? You know, the phrase wilderness experience is an idiom that has entered our language from the Bible. You know, a wilderness experience is a tough time. It usually involves discomfort, anguish, trial, temptation, 
maybe even spiritual attack. Life as it once was is out of reach. A wilderness experience is a time of crisis. We as a nation, given the events we have witnessed, may be in the wilderness. It's as if we both want and need wilderness experiences for our well-being. When we want wildernesses, wilderness, rather, we seek it out. And when we need wilderness, God leads us there. So that's wilderness. Hold on to that. The second is the action of the story which is temptation. You know, Jesus' temptation story always shows up on the first Sunday in Lent. Jesus' 40-day temptation sets the stage for our 40-day observance of Lent. Jesus is tempted by Satan to be the person Satan wants him to be instead of the person God wants him to be. This is Mark's spiritual worldview. It also happens to be the Christian spiritual worldview. There were two paths before Jesus in that wilderness. And there are two paths before each one of us in our own metaphorical wildernesses. God's and Satan's. Life and death, good and evil, right and wrong, truth and lies, light and darkness, wholeness and brokenness, hatred and love, peace and violence. And for Jesus it was, what's it going to be? And for us it's, what's it going to be? to be. You know, mainline Protestant Christians, that includes Presbyterians like me, like you, like us, we don't talk much about Satan. And perhaps it's a little too much Dana Carvey, church lady-esque. And I I, I did the move at Newstone, but thank goodness I'm hidden behind. So... And maybe that's the way Satan likes it. The more Satan stays off or below the radar, the better. In the dark, evil can work covertly. You know, Satan shows up in all three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Satan's name means accuser, adversary. Satan is a malevolent figure who is hell-bent, pun intended, on seducing humanity away from God and into sin and too often is successful in doing so. Now, if you ask me, 30 years ago, whether I believed in Satan, I would have said no. I was younger and thought I could explain Satan's existence away with numerous sophisticated theological arguments I had learned in seminary. But if you ask me today, my answer is Yes, I'm older, I've lived longer, I've seen more, I've experienced more. I say yes because Satan, and when I use the word for me, it is evil personified, helps me understand the seriousness of life and especially the seriousness of the Christian life, 
that chooses regularly to trust God and Christ and follow Jesus over and against all the other ways there are to be in the world. That, by the way, are tempting but deadly. You know, early in his papacy, Pope Francis was asked by someone during a general audience at the Vatican what he should do for Lent. You know, what a good question. Today is the first Sunday of Lent. We celebrated Ash Wednesday on Wednesday. So might we ask, what should we do for Lent? Listen to what Pope Francis said. He said, Lent is a powerful season. Lent is a turning point that can foster change and conversion in each of us. You know, we all need to improve, to change for the better. Lent helps us and thus we leave behind old habits and the lazy addiction to the evil that deceives and ensnares us. I like Francis's phrase, lazy addiction to evil. You know, going along with evil's fruit, its hurtfulness, its anger, its pessimism, its fear, its selfishness, its indifference, its violence, takes no spiritual effort at all. It's the low road. It's the path of least resistance. It costs us absolutely nothing in the moment, but in time it costs us everything. But standing against evil and with God and choosing God's way where the fruit is kindness and patience and hope and trust and joy and compassion and peace will take everything we've got and even then without the Holy Spirit in us still won't be enough. But with the Holy Spirit, it will be, and it is. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us present now our tithe and our offering.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. It is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use us and our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Be seated, please. Friends, hear this invitation to the Lord's table. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. He invites all who trust him to come and to commune with him and to commune with others who bear his name as well. Let us celebrate.
Be seated, please. I invite you to join, join me in the responsive opening of our great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world for your promise to Israel and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life, eating with sinners, he welcomes us, guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, he heals us, dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. Living with you, he prays for us. Lord, hear now our prayers for others. We pray especially for Anna Marie Jones. We pray for neighbors in Parkland, Florida. And Lord, we use this silence to lift before you those prayers you have given to us to pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear us now. With thanksgiving, O Lord, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that this meal may be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast. Unite us in faith. Encourage us with hope, inspire us to love, that we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we pray, our Father, who art in heaven. 